Okay, at this point in the story, they're now settling into their new life in Alabama. And life is hard, but she's also finding a path forward. If you recall, Nicholas, Cassidy, if you recall, she has stood up for herself. She's shown the bullies that she can, she is a force to be reckoned with, right? Her brothers helped her. They're finding their place in their new world. So everything has been turned inside out, right? Quiet. Everything's been turned inside out, but it maybe is coming together. So the final section is from now on. I would like you all to be very quiet. Letter from the North. Eight months ago, war ended. Four months ago, mother sent out a letter. Today, father's brothers answer. Still, we know nothing more. Our uncle even went south to talk with our old neighbors to find father's old friends. He consulted, left word, waited until it became more obvious, until it became obvious he would know nothing more. His letter doesn't tell us what to do from now on. We look to mother. She doesn't tell us either. Ours is a silent Christmas Eve. <laughs> Gift exchange day. I'd like everybody to be very silent, please. Gift exchange day. Pem comes over on gift exchange day with a doll to replace the mouth's bitten one I told her about. I almost scream because the doll with long black hair is so beautiful. But I whisper, thank you. My high emotions are squished beneath the embarrassment of not having a gift for her. December 25. What if? Brother Kwong asks, what if father escaped into Cambodia and is building an army to go back and change history? What if, uh, Vu Li asks, what if father escaped to France but can't remember his own history so he builds a new family and is happy? Brother Khoi asks, what if father escaped to Tibet after shaving his head and joining a monastery? I can't think of anything but can't let my brothers best me. So I blurt out, what if father is really gone? From the sad look on their faces, I know, despite their brave guesses, they have begun to accept what I said on a whim. December 29th. A sign. Mother says nothing about father, but she chants every night. Long chants where her voice wavers between hope and acceptance. She's waiting for a sign. I'll decide what she decides. December 30th. Please be quiet, everyone. No more. First day back after Christmas break, I know I'm supposed to wear everything new. I don't have anything new except for the coat and a hand-me-down dress still wrapped in plastic. It's beige with blue flowers made from a fabric fuzzy and thick, perfect for this cold day. Best of all, it's past my knees, perfect for a cold bike ride. Pem is wearing a new skirt, falling to her calves as always. Sativan's new white shirt looks stiff as a wall. As soon as I remove my coat, everyone stops talking. A girl in red velvet comes over to me. Don't you know flannel is for nightgowns and sheets? I panic. Bem shrugs. I can't wear pants or cut my hair or wear skirts above my calves. What do I care what you wear? Sativan says, it looks like a dress to me. The red velvet girl points to the middle of my chest. See this flower? They only put that on nightgowns. I look down at the tiny blue flower, barely stitched on. I rip it off. Night gone, no more. January 5th. I, seeds. I wear the same dress to sleep, telling mother why. I pretended not to care. Then no one cared, so I really didn't care. Mother laughs. I tell her a much worse embarrassment is not having a gift for Pem. Mother nods, thinks, goes to her top drawer. I was saving this for you for Tet, but why wait? In her palm lies the tin of flower seeds I had gathered with Titi. Perfect for Pem. Mother always thinks of everything. 
January 5th, night. Gone. Mother runs in after work, hands clenched into white balls, words chopped into grunts, faces of ash. We stare at her left hand. The amethyst stone is gone. Brother Kwong drives us back to the sewing factory in his car made of mismatched parts. We search where Mother sat, then retrace her steps to the cafeteria, to the bathroom, to the parking lot. We repeat so often we lose count, propelled by Mother's wild eyes and pressed mouth, frightened of what her expression would be if... At dusk, the guards shoo us out. We're afraid to look at Mother. Truly gone. When home, Mother retreats to our room, misses dinner, remains soundless. At bedtime, we hear the gong, then chanting. The chant is long, the voice low and sure. Finally, she appears, looks at each of us. Your father is truly gone. January 14th, late. <clears throat> Mother, eternal peace. Mother wears her brown dye brought from home. Each of us, each of my brothers wears a suit, too small or too big. I wear a pink dress of ruffles and lace, which I hate, but at least it's definitely a dress. Each of us faces the altar, holding a lit incense stick between palms in prayer. Father's portrait stares back. This is as old as we'll ever know him. That thought turns my eyes red. Mother says, we'll chant for Father's safe passage toward eternal peace, where his parents await him. She pauses, voice choked. Father won't leave if we hold on to him. If you feel like crying, think, at least now we know. At least we no longer live in waiting. January 17th. Start over. I'm trying to tell Mrs. Washington about our ceremony for Father, but it takes time to match every noun and verb, sort out all the tenses, remember all the articles, set the tone for every S. Mrs. Washington says if every learner waits to speak perfectly, no one would learn a new language. Being stubborn won't make you fluent. Practicing will. The more mistakes you make, the more you'll learn not to. They laugh. Shame on them. Challenge them to say something in Vietnamese and right, laugh right back. I tell her father is at peace. I tell her I'd like to plant flowers from Vietnam in her backyard. I tell her Tet is coming and luck starts over every new year. January 19th. An engineer, a chef, a vet, and not a lawyer. Brother Kwong has started night school to restudy engineering to become what he was meant to be. Mother smiles. Vu Li refuses to apply to a real college. Instead, will go to a cooking school in San Francisco, where his idol once walked. Mother sighs, twists her brows to no effect. Brother Koi announces he will become a doctor of animals. Mother starts to say something, then nods. Mother has always wanted an engineer, a real doctor, a poet, and a lawyer. She turns to me. You love to argue, right? No, I don't. She brightens. I vow to become much more agreeable. 1976. Year of the Dragon. This Tet, there's no I Ching teller of fate. So mother predicts our year. Our lives will twist and twist, intermingling the old and the new until it doesn't matter which is which. This tet, there's no ban chung in the shape of a square made of pork, glutinous rice, and mung beans wrapped in banana leaves. Mother makes her own in the shape of a log made of pork, regular rice, and black beans wrapped in cloth. Not the same, but not bad. As with every tet, we are expected to smile until it hurts all three first days of the year. Wear all new clothes, especially underneath. Not sweep, not splash water, not talk back, not pout. Mother thinks of everything. She even asked Brother Kwong to bless the house right after midnight so I couldn't beat him to it. By touching my big toe to the carpet before dawn. Mother has set up an altar on the highest bookshelf. The same for every young portrait of father. I have to look away. We each hold an incense stick and wait for the gong. 
I pray for Father to find warmth in his new home, Mother to keep smiling more, Brother Kwong to enjoy his studies, Vu Li to drive me from and to school, Brother Koi to hatch an American chick. I open my eyes. The others are still praying. What could they be asking for? Nicholas? I think and think, then close my eyes again. This year I hope I truly learn to fly kick, not to kick anyone so much as to fly. January 31st, Tet. And that's the end of the novel portion. Well, I'm going to read this last little bit, okay? <clears throat> Author's note. Dear reader, much of what has happened to Ha, the main character inside out and back again, also happened to me. At age 10, I too witnessed the end of Vietnam War and fled to Alabama with my family. I too had a father who was missing in action. I also had to learn English and even had my arm hair pulled the first day of school. The fourth graders wanted to make sure I was real, not an image they had seen on TV. So many details in this story were inspired by my own memories. Aside from remembering facts, I worked hard to catch, capture Ha's emotional life. What was it like to live where bombs exploded every night, yet where sweet snacks popped up at every corner? What was it like to sit on a ship, sit on a ship, heading toward hope. What was it like to go from knowing you're smart to feeling dumb all the time? The emotional aspect is important because of something I noticed in my nieces and nephews. They may know in general where their parents came from, but they can't really imagine the noises and smells of Vietnam, the daily challenges of starting over in a strange land. I extend this idea to all. How much do we know about those around us? I hope you enjoy reading about Ha's, Ha as much as I have enjoyed remembering the pivotal year in my life. I also hope after you finish this book that you sit close to someone you love and employ that person to tell and tell and tell their story. Tana Lai. Okay. Let's uh, close the recording.